Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei whisky.de, dem Treffpunkt Feine Geister. Und ich befinde mich am Fintorn-Fluss. Ja, und hinter mir ist das Fintorn-Viadukt, ein ja, Meisterstück britischer Ingenieurskunst. Und es wurde gebaut im viktorianischen Zeitalter. Angefangen wurde der Bau 1894, fertiggestellt wurde es 1897 und verbindet die große Stadt Inverness mit dem Rest der British Railway. Und ab da war dann ja, in, auch in den nördlicheren Highlands ja, alles viel besser zugänglich und ja, es konnte Industrialisierung in die letzten Regionen des, ja, britischen, der britischen Insel kommen. Ja, und jetzt gehen wir mal ein bisschen weiter und schauen uns, was es da für tolle Brennereien gibt. Die Geschichte der Brennerei oder des Brennens bei Tomatin fängt sehr, sehr, sehr weit in der Vergangenheit an. Es gibt hier in der Nähe der Brennerei eine Ruine und diese Ruine ähm, hatte eine Brennblase. Und diese Brennblase wurde konfisziert und deswegen auch in den ja, staatlichen Büchern aufgeschrieben. Und deswegen wissen wir jetzt, dass hier 1747 illegal gebrannt wurde. Was wir noch wissen, ist, ja, die, man kann ungefähr die Größe der Still abschätzen, denn die Still hat eben, ja, dreieinhalb Kilogramm oder ein bisschen mehr sogar 3, also 7 Pfund Silber war sie wert. Und ja, das sind dann irgendwo dreieinhalb Kilo, 3,7 Kilo, irgendwo da wird es in der, in der Gegend sein. Ja, und das war damals und die Geschichte der Brennerei fängt dann 1897 an, als John McDougall, ein ja, lokaler, sehr engagierter Mann, der war Lehrer und Bürgermeister und was er noch alles war, der hat sich sehr engagiert für diese, für diese kleine Stadt Tomatin und wollte da ein bisschen was entwickeln in der Stadt. Und jetzt, da die, ja, die Eisenbahn gebaut wurde, hatte er, sah er die Möglichkeit, hier Industrie anzusiedeln. Und was hat er gemacht? Ja, sehr schottisch. Er hat eine Brennerei gegründet, die Tomatin Brennerei. Und ja, sie wurde aufgebaut und sie lief relativ gut bis 1906. Also damals war es noch, alles wurde lokal verkauft oder an Blender verkauft. Und äh, da gab es eine ja, große Blenderfamilie, die Pattersons. Und die haben ähm, sehr, sehr viel Whisky verkauft. Und ja, da gibt es tolle Geschichten über die. Die, die haben ähm, Papageien importiert und sie trainiert zu sagen, order Patterson Whisky. Und, äh, oder buy Patterson Whisky oder drink Patterson Whisky. Und die haben sie dann in die Bars gesetzt. Alle fanden es voll lustig und haben dann mehr von diesem Whisky getrunken. Aber die hatten so ein bisschen Spekulationen gemacht. Die haben dann irgendwie ihren Whisky bewertet und das hat eine ja, Spekulationsblase hervorgerufen. Und da sind eine ganze Menge Brennereien darüber gestolpert und daran ja, kaputt gegangen, auch die Tomatenbrennerei. Sie ist ja, geschlossen, sie wurde geschlossen und erst 1909, also relativ kurz danach, glücklicherweise, wurde sie dann gekauft von äh, Weinhändlern aus London. Und das war so eine perfekte Synergie, weil die extrem viele Fässer hatten. Die hatten sehr, sehr schöne, viele Weinfässer und die hatten sogar auch eine der ersten Aufzeichnungen, wo man Bourbonfässer aus Amerika nach Schottland gebracht hat und den, äh, da den Whisky drin gelagert hat. Ja, also die haben das Ganze richtig gut aufgezogen und die Brennerei ist größer geworden, sie wurde ausgebaut und dann 1974 ist die Brennerei so groß geworden, dass sie insgesamt äh, 23 Stills hatte. Riesig wurde die größte Brennerei in Schottland und die größte Malt-Brennerei der Welt, dass sie wirklich den Markt dominiert hat. Und ja, als der Hörmann steigt, desto tiefer fällt man. Ähm, mit dem Blend Crash, damals war alles für die Blend-Industrie. Und mit dem Blend Crash in den 80ern ähm, ist dann die Brennerei auch ja, pleite gegangen. Sie wurde auch liquidiert, wurde aber dann ähm, 
von einer japanischen Firma aufgekauft und diese Firma besitzt äh, Tomaten heute noch und führt sie jetzt als ja, fast vollständig Single Malt Whisky Brennerei weiter. Sie hat noch ein bisschen was, was sie an Fässern ähm, tauscht, also sie produzieren ein paar Fässer, die sie tauschen können, um dann ihre eigenen Blends herzustellen. Alles andere ist dann Single Malt Whisky und den schauen wir uns heute mal an, wie der gemacht wird. Die Brennerei bekommt ihr Wasser aus dem Altner Frith, den ihr hier seht. Das heißt auf Gälisch so viel wie ja, der Fluss des Rotwilds, der Hirschen. Also das Frith ist hier so das Land und es wird wegen Hirschen so benannt. Und sie kommen, äh, das Wasser kommt aus den Monolith, Mount, Monolith Mountains und das ist, ähm, es fließt durch Granit, es fließt durch Moor und es wird so stark gefiltert, dass dieses Wasser hier extrem mineralarm ist. Und diese Mineralstoffe, die in verschiedenen Wassern normalerweise drin sind, die bringen wirklich sehr unangenehme Geschmäcker in den Whisky. Und dieses ja, sehr, sehr mineralarme Wasser ist perfekt für die Whisky-Produktion. Interessant ist, der Fluss fließt gar nicht mehr so lang und geht dann in das Findhorn. Und das ist äh, einer der größeren Flüsse, der ist ziemlich genauso groß wie die Spey und ist einer der Flüsse, der parallel zur Spey fließt. Aber es ist eben kein Fluss, der in die Spey fließt, also die Altner fließt, fließt nicht in die Spey. Deswegen zählt Tomatin nicht mehr zu der Spey Side, sondern es ist eine Highland Brennerei. Da die Brennerei ja mal richtig, richtig groß war und ähm, die größte Schottlands war, wie ich euch in der Geschichte erzählt hatte, gibt es hier noch sehr, sehr viel ja, Equipment, sehr, sehr viel Sachen, die noch etwas zu groß sind für die Produktion. So zum Beispiel das Malzlager. Das Malzlager ist dafür ausgelegt, 500 Tonnen Malz lagern zu können. Also es sind 10 ja, Silos mit jeweils 50 Tonnen. Am Ende gibt das 500 Tonnen Malz. Das ist viel zu viel für die derzeitige Produktion. Aber ja, man baut sie nicht ab, weil es mehr Aufwand wäre, sie abzubauen. Und vielleicht wird man ja auch irgendwann mal später noch etwas größer. Dann kann man sie wieder gebrauchen. Aber als nächstes reden wir mal über das Malz, was dann gemahlen wird. Hinter mir steht eine Porteous Malt Mill. Das hier ist eine relativ junge Malzmühle sogar, denn äh, ich habe ja schon öfters über diese Porteous Mühlen geredet, dass sie so extrem alt sind und dann irgendwann die Firma pleite gegangen ist, weil sie so robust waren. Die Firma ist pleite gegangen, hat aber ihre, ihre ja, Pläne und ihre Patente weitergegeben an Richard Sizes Limited. Und die haben dann mit diesem Patent einfach weiter diese wahnsinnig tollen Maschinen gebaut. Und äh, deswegen sind, es gibt es auch etwas jüngere. Und man sieht auch, diese hier ist auch ein gutes Stückchen größer. Gut, reden wir mal, wo die Tomatenbrennerei ihr Malz herbekommt. Sie bekommt es von ja, unabhängigen Melzern, aber die ähm, versichern Tomatin, dass sie ihr Getreide aus Schottland bekommen. Also Tomatin braut nur ihr Wash mit Malz aus schottischem ja, Gerste, aus schottischer Gerste, also ein bisschen Alleinstellungsmerkmal. Außerdem machen sie fast nur ungetorfte Gerste. Ich sage fast nur ungetorfte, weil es ja immer noch den Kyobokken gibt, der ja, torfig ist, der rauchig ist. Und das machen sie nur für eine Woche im Jahr. Für eine Woche im Jahr kaufen sie getorftes ähm, Malz. Und das ja, variieren sie so. Sie variieren eher so im unteren Bereich um 15 ppm rum. Und äh, ja, sie sind aber auch schon einmal hochgegangen auf 45, aber sie wollen eher so unten bleiben auf 15, weil das eher so der alte Stil des rauchigen schottischen Whiskys ist, wo eigentlich gar nicht so viel der Rauch drin sein sollte. Aber das ist der einzige, ja, der einzige Brennmaterial, was sie hatten war, musste der Rauch da irgendwie rein. Also einmal im Jahr, einmal die, eine Woche im Jahr gibt es Chewbocken geräuchert, ansonsten alles schottische, ungetorfte Gerste und die wird dann hier in dieser Malzmühle schön zu einem ja, groben Schrot zusammen gemahlen. Die Mashtan hinter mir ist eine der ja, älteren rostfreien stahl -Mashtans. Sie wurde nämlich schon in den 70ern eingebaut und man befüllt sie mit 9 Tonnen Gerstenschrot und sie wird in drei ja, Läutervorgängen wird dann der Zucker und teilweise noch die Stärke aus dem Malz herausgewaschen. 
Ähm, sie fangen an mit äh, 32.000 Litern Wasser bei 63 Grad, gehen dann weiter auf 14,5.000 Litern ja, bei ca. 76 Grad und der letzte Vorgang ist dann nochmal mit 15.000 Litern Wasser bei ja, über 90 Grad Celsius und da wäscht man auch noch den allerletzten Rest Zucker raus, wobei da schon so wenig vorhanden ist, dass man das Wasser irgendwo aufbewahrt und dann beim nächsten Vorgang als Waschwasser verwendet, damit man wirklich das Maximum an Zucker aus der Gerste herauswaschen kann. Und mit diesem sehr, sehr zuckrigen Wasser, mit dem kann man dann perfekt Whisky ja erstmal fermentieren. Die Fermentation bei Tomatin ist außergewöhnlich. Wir haben zwölf Washbags mit jeweils 45.000 Litern Volumen und das Interessante bei Tomatin ist, dass sie extrem lange fermentieren. Es ist die langste, längste Fermentationsdauer in der schottischen Whisky-Industrie und sie fermentieren 168 Stunden, was eine Woche ist. Ja, das heißt, sie fermentieren eine Woche und haben zwölf Washbacks, also machen sie zwölf Mash oder zwölf Destillationen pro Woche. Und ich habe hier einen dieser äh, Mash Tons, äh, diese Washbacks neben mir und der ist kurz vor Ende. Also da ist wirklich alles durchfermentiert. In den ersten 48 Stunden haben wir alkoholische Fermentation und nach 48 Stunden haben wir laktobakterielle Fermentation und sie sagen so noch andere Bakterien, die da auch noch arbeiten und das wirklich extrem fruchtig machen. Also hier wird das, der, der letzte Rest an fruchtig rausgeholt und am Ende ist, geht es sogar richtig kräftig noch in tropische Früchte über. Riech jetzt mal hier rein. Ach, immer aufpassen, wenn ihr da rein riecht, wenn die noch am Arbeiten sind, können die sehr, sehr stark sein und ihr könnt ohnmächtig werden. Der ist jetzt aber schon so schön fertig und der riecht richtig, richtig tropisch. Also Banane ist drin, da ist äh, für mich vor allem äh, un nee, nicht unreife, überreife Zuckermelone. Also Oh, das riecht sogar ein bisschen so ein bisschen wie, wie dieses Steck, ähm, dieses, ja, diese Eiscreme oder nicht Eiscreme, sondern so Wassereis mit, mit diesen ganzen oh, wahnsinnigen fruchtigen tropischen Früchten, Wassermelone, Zuckermelone, also extrem fruchtig hier bei Tomatin. Und das ist die Ausgangsbasis für die Destillation, die wir uns gleich anschauen. Hier bin, stehe ich neben Washstill Nummer 1 von Tomatin. Aber das war nicht immer so, wie es heutzutage ist. Früher war es ganz, ganz anders. Die Brennerei hatte damals äh, 23 Brennblasen. 12 davon Washstills, 11 davon Spirit Stills. Und das Interessante war hier, dass sie früher alle mit Kohle befeuert wurden. Also hinten, großes Tor, kam die Kohle rein. Hier waren Berge voll Kohle und die Kohle musste man dann unter die Brennblase schaufeln und die Brennblase wurde mit Kohle befeuert. Und die Brennblase wurde durch dieses Kohlebefeuern somit gesteuert. Also wie viel, wie stark die Brennblase brennt. Sehr, sehr ungenau und äh, ja, ein sehr, sehr schnelles Brennen im Gegensatz zu dem, was man heutzutage hat. Und wenn die Leute oben geschaut hätten beim Watchglas, ob die Brennblase überkocht, und dann runtergelaufen werden, die Kohle unten äh, ja, weniger stark gemacht hätten, dann wäre die zu schnell übergelaufen. Das hätte nicht funktioniert. Also war das äh, das Ganze der Working Floor, also der, der Arbeits, die Arbeitsebene, war unterhalb der, der Brennblasen. Und da hatte man ein System, man hatte einfach eine Schnur, die hat man sogar heute noch, ich weiß nicht, ob sie nur zu Anschauungszwecken ist, und damit hat man gezogen und dann stößt eine kleine, ja, was wird es sein, Holzkugel gegen die Brennblase und man hört ein Geräusch und dieses Geräusch äh, zeigt einem, ob das Ganze sich sehr hohl anhört oder ob man merkt, ah ja, da ist schon was drin, wir sind schon am Hochkochen, muss man ein bisschen runtergehen mit der Geschwindigkeit. Das Überkochen war damals extrem gefährlich, denn man hatte noch nicht so viele Sicherheitseinrichtungen, das heißt eine Brennblase konnte leicht dann verstopfen und äh, explodieren oder dann verstopfen, man hat sie ausgeschaltet und dann haben sie implodiert. War eine sehr, sehr gefährliche Geschichte. Ja. Heutzutage hat die Brennerei äh, noch zwölf Brennblasen, davon zehn Brennblasen, die noch äh, betrieben werden. 
sechs Wash Stills und vier Spirit Stills werden noch betrieben. Ungefähr, es werden zwei Wash Bags werden zur Befüllung von Wash, äh, sechs Wash Stills benutzt. Und das heißt, jede Wash Still wird ungefähr mit äh, 15.000 Litern befüllt und dann wird das Ganze destilliert. Und jetzt gehen wir mal hoch und schauen uns mal so eine Spirit Still von oben an. Da habe ich nämlich auch noch was Cooles gefunden. Neben mir ist eine der Spirit Stills, aber die Spirit Stills sind hier relativ schwer zu unterscheiden von den Wash Stills, denn sie haben das gleiche Design, sie sind gleiche Größe, es sind im Grunde die gleichen Stills. Sie, diese Form von Stills ist sogar das alte Design von Alexander McKenzie, der Designer, der sie 1897 entworfen hat und ja, so sind die Brennblasen heute noch. Sie wurden natürlich gewartet ähm, und was auch noch sehr interessant ist, ist, ähm, sie brauchen nur vier Spirit Stills und sie haben echt ziemlich lange ja, Dauern für die Destillation. Also sie, sie destillieren relativ langsam. Ist ein bisschen trügerisch, weil wenn man hier anschaut, man sieht sie sehr, sehr vergilbt und schon, ja, man merkt, okay, die waren schon sehr, sehr heiß. Aber das liegt einfach daran, dass sie älter sind. Das liegt nicht daran, dass sie jetzt besonders heiß brennen, sondern sie brennen eher langsam. Wir haben 13 Stunden für die äh, Wash Still Destillation und 12 Stunden für die Spirit Still Destillation. Und das ist ja, relativ langsam, relativ gemächlich. Was auch noch interessant ist, sie versuchen ihren Cutoff Point ein bisschen, also ihren zweiten Cutoff Point ein bisschen höher zu haben, damit sie einen weicheren Brand haben. Beim Kuboken geht man sogar ein Stückchen noch runter, um ein bisschen mehr, ja, ein bisschen mehr Würze in den Brand reinzukriegen. Und ja, das ist die Destillation bei Tomatin und jetzt schauen wir uns mal ganz an, was wie die Lagerung aussieht. Tomatin hat auch noch richtig viele Lagerhäuser aus der Zeit, wo sie noch ja, sehr, sehr, sehr groß waren. Sie haben zwei Dunnage Warehouses und elf weitere Racked Warehouses und sie haben eine Kapazität von einer Viertelmillion Fässern, die sie lagern können. Es werden zurzeit 170.000 Fässern eingelagert, aber es sind ja, nur ein Teil davon von Tomatin. Also Tomatin ja, vermietet Lagerplätze, wo andere Brennereien sich dann einmieten können und ihren Whisky lagern können. Was sie auch noch hier on site haben, ist ein, ja, eine kleine Küchenerei, also aber Sie bauen keine Fässer, sondern sie reparieren eher Fässer, machen eher Instandhaltung. Das ist sehr praktisch für eine Brennerei, wenn sie äh, Fässer einkaufen will. Wenn sie irgendwo nach Italien, nach Spanien, nach Portugal fahren und dort Fässer kaufen. Und dann sehen sie irgendwelche Fässer und dann, ja, sind wir, hey, welchen guten Zustand sind sie, sollen wir sie noch renovieren oder so? Äh, nee, nee, passt schon. Packt sie alle ein. Äh, wir können die selbst bei uns daheim reparieren. Also da kann man auch mal ein bisschen... Ja, ein bisschen mutiger sein, wenn man Fässer kauft, wo man dann sagt, ja, okay, dann repariere ich sie halt noch daheim. Aber man hat dann eben schöne Fässer gekauft, die vielleicht in einem nicht ganz so guten Dichtheitszustand sind. Ja, die Brennerei hat viele, viele, viele verschiedene Fässer. Wir haben äh, Portfässer, wir haben Sherry, wir haben Hogsets, wir haben Bourbon Barrels. Aber es gibt auch noch eine ganze Menge, Menge mehr. Wir haben es ja bei den Abfüllungen, kann man das immer sehr schön sehen, was die Brennerei so auch in den Lagernhäusern hat. Also Masala Madeira und so weiter und so fort. Ganz viele verschiedene Arten von äh, Fasslagerung. Und hinter mir, das ist was sehr, sehr Schönes für die Tour. Und zwar sind das Fässer aus jedem Jahrgang, den die Brennerei hat. Und das fängt an beim oh, richtig teuren Fass. 1967 ist hier das älteste Fass in der Brennerei. Und das geht dann weiter 1971 und geht ho weit hoch bis 2018. Die neuesten Fässer haben sie gesagt, es ist nicht ganz so wichtig, sie hinzustellen, wie dann die ältesten Fässer, weil die sind ja, am spektakulärsten. Ja, genau. Das war es jetzt hier mit der Produktion und jetzt geht es noch weiter mit einem kleinen Interview. So, das war's mit der Produktion und jetzt gibt es noch ein kleines Interview. So, I'm sitting here with Graham Inson, uh, 31 years experience in the whiskey industry, 10 years here at Tomatum. A lot of experience, you're the master distiller here. But yeah, that job comes with a bit more responsibility than just distilling. So thank you very much for having us here. Well, I'm delighted to have you here. It's good, good to see you here. It's, this last couple of years, we've not had many visitors. So it's tremendous to have someone like yourself actually come along 
I'm joy to see you at the moment. Yeah, I'm certainly. I'm I'm really glad that I can be up here in the, in the, in Scotland again. It's it's just very nice, and you got really a nice history and really nice surrounding here. It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're 15 miles or so from uh, from Inverness, 20 mm -hmm. minutes drive. And despite that, it's almost like you're out in the wilderness here on the top of the Mona Lea Mountains. It's beautiful scenery, mm -hmm. a nice place to both live and work, I would say. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's nice to, to have a, a bigger city nearby and just the, the great highlands. that got really good fishing grounds back, back down there and it's just that the mountains are already snowed in a little bit a, a little a wee bit yes a wee bit yeah. and as for the fishing goes my fishing skills are basically nil <laughs> mine as well <laughs> <laughs> i've tried fishing in the sea but uh i only catch kelp now so um we got four whiskies here so where are we starting uh, we will start with the the legacy um mm -hmm. our sort of it's a known aged spirit mm -hmm. um but it's it's one that's quite an interesting whisky on how it actually came to be. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably one of the more simple recipes. Um, but mm -hmm. even within that, the, the history of how it came about is quite interesting because we have um, 29 houses on site, so quite a large proportion of our staff live here. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did, it was it would be about a year, maybe two years after I joined to Martin, that Stephen Bremner, who was at the time our marketing director, he's now our managing director, came to me and said, Graham, can you have a, a look at our stock profile mm -hmm. and see what we can do to make a tomato that's probably a bit younger um, or at least appeals to a younger market. Um, we wanted to be reasonably light and sweet, easy to drink. Mm -hmm. um, and he gave me a, a few parameters that he was wanting to be within. So I went away and I looked at the stocks that we have um, and I came back to him with five different recipes um, mm -hmm. for this new product. So we, between Stephen Graham Nicholson, who's one of our, well, now a sales director, and myself, we, we know the, the five samples and went, I don't really like that one, not too sure about that one. But the other three that were left, we went, well, they're all really, really good. And what we decided to do was rather than us make that call ourselves, we invited every member of staff to either come into the office here <laughs> and nose and taste the whiskey, or if they were driving, which a lot of them were obviously, to come in, take three sample bottles home, labelled A, B and C, taste them, nose them with their family, friends, and then come back in a few days later and tell us which one they preferred. Um, we they didn't know any of the recipes or anything, so what they came back with then was actually, if I remember rightly, it was actually sample A was the favourite out of the lot. Mm -hmm. So it was really the all our colleagues within Tomato Distillery Company Limited that chose the final recipe for the legacy. Ah, okay. And it's there to sort of remind everyone about our legacy, you know, the fact that we were founded over 120 years ago, that you know, there's a lot of people who live on site. We have a lot of history of members of the same family have born, brought up here, worked here, next generations followed on and such like. So it's all a sort of reflection of that uh, into this final whiskey, which they helped choose the final recipe of. So yeah, it's, yeah I'm, uh, I'm really excited now how how that whiskey will, will smell and feel because I, I've just been to your, your wash bags and that was incredible okay i've i've had quite an, a whiff of wash bags in yeah. my in my tours uh but this was uh even beyond the the normal fruitiness and went really far into that tropical fermented yeah. fruit overripe fruit watermelon and yeah. and i'm excited if i if i can find that in here i think i think you should i mean that's the one thing we always try to do with all the tomato range is keep our house style, for want of a better mm -hmm. description. Um, the house style really is that sort of soft, sweet, but not excessively sweet. Um, mm -hmm. But really the, the fruitiness needs to shine through there. Um, that's what I would look for in a new make spirit. But I would also like to see a lot of that lasting right through all the maturation into the final product and being enhanced by the casks we use. So mm -hmm. for the legacy, um, it's slightly unusual in that we'll use European, sorry, American virgin oak oh, in this. Okay. 
um, for a certain percentage along with first fill ex bourbons. Um, mm -hmm. So that the first fill ex bourbons, you're always going to get that sort of coconut, vanilla type sweetness, which enhances mm -hmm. the natural sweetness we'll find in the new make. And then just to give it an extra boost, the virgin oak are in there, and, and that really gives it more of what you would expect to find in a bourbon, mm -hmm. I guess. Yep. You know, so marrying that together, the legacy is very, very sweet characteristics that come through. You get the, the sort of toffee, caramel type sweetness, the vanilla, the coconut. You know, it's that family of aromas and flavours that you will find in there. Mm -hmm. But always in the background, you get that rich fruit character in there as well. You know, mm -hmm. the, the softer fruits, as you say, mm -hmm. um, coming through on the nose. Yeah, and I like find it. them on the taste as well. Yeah, it's it's more of a bourbon style than I would have expected. But yeah, if you say virgin American oak, then yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're talking around about 15% of the maturation okay. is, is in, in virgin oak casks. Mm -hmm. So it has, we don't want to go any more than that because virgin oak can be quite overwhelming in its character. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. So keeping it at around about the 15% mark ensures that it doesn't overwhelm the flavours. It just really gives them that wee bit more zest, more sort of character in there. So you get a, a really easy to drink but flavoursome. That's what we're, we're trying to do with this. Uh, great for cocktails. Um, as well as you know, a, a nice warm summer's day, which is not really outside the moment. <laughs> yeah, um, but also a nice winter day. <laughs> a nice winter day as well, yeah. It's, it's a nice easy dram to yep. actually drink, and, and that's really what we're after. Slunge it? Slunge it. Flavour wise, it's quite similar to what you find on the nose. There's not any huge surprises jumping out in there. Mm -hmm. Which is again something that we were aiming to do. Um, it's certainly not a one-dimensional whiskey. You know, there is, there's a mm -hmm. range of characters in there, but the nose and the flavours are quite similar. You know, there's not a huge mm -hmm. divergence there. It's it's nice fruity, it has that vanilla, that caramel, that mm, bit of a toffee's note in yeah. there. It's, yeah. it's a, a nice bourbon style whiskey. Would have expected Less of an oaky touch to it. It has an oaky touch to it as well. Is, yeah, and that, that's the mm. virgin oak that brings that's that. That's the virgin oak that just yeah. gives a bit more volume to it. It does, yeah. It mm -hmm. does. It stops it from being too much one dimensional. Mm -hmm. know, it gives that wee bit of spiciness, I would argue, in there, the, the virgin oak, you know, mm -hmm. coming directly from the wood, obviously. So that uh, it, it gives it a bit more character. And that's why it works so well in, in um, cocktails. Mm -hmm. It's because there is that depth there, you know, it's, it's not just vanilla and nothing else, you know, there's mm -hmm. quite a bit more to it. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's um, it's a nice nice everyday dram. It is, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm slightly biased because this was actually the first whiskey that I <laughs> basically developed from day one. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, as you said, I worked in the whiskey industry. Uh, quite a few years now, despite the youthful good looks, obviously. But uh, <laughs> I mean, this, this is the first one that I've really been responsible for bringing it to where it is. Um, so it's one that I'm, I'm I think, justifiably be proud of mm -hmm. um, because I had the involvement all the way through the development of it um, mm. to get it to where it is now. And I still look after the recipe for it and select the casts and. I have to go and nose them and taste them from time to time. It's a terrible job, you know, but some <laughs> Yeah, really, really hard. So, yeah, the distillery is uh, quite um, quite a, a place on its own. I've had, I've heard uh, that you have 30 houses now <laughs> that, that the distillery owns. And is, is that like a big family or how, how does that work? It is to a great extent, yeah. I mean, the distillery itself, it's, it's had a lot of phases in its in its history, in its life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we founded in 1897, but then in the early 1900s it was shut down, then reopened. You know, it's a lot of opens and closings through over the years. Mm -hmm. And then when it got to the 1970s, um, it was actually became the biggest single malt distillery in Scotland. And it mm -hmm. held that title for quite a lot of years until just in the, the sort of late 1990s, early 2000s type idea. Mm -hmm. um, because of that and because of the perceived remoteness, mm -hmm. um, although we're only 20 minutes from Inverness now with modern roads, <laughs> if you go back to the turn of the century, it was quite a, a trek to get here. Mm -hmm. So the houses were needed on site for the, the workers of the distillery mm -hmm. and warehousing to actually live here. 
Um, most distilleries now have sold them on, um, but we decided no, we would we would keep them. Mm. So it does give a almost a family type or a small village type atmosphere around the distillery because the, the houses are right in the middle mm -hmm. really you know you've got warehouses down at the bottom of the site beyond the railway line you've got more warehouses and production site here but the houses are intermingled with all that mm -hmm. so that it does mean that the the people who live here and work here it's not a job you know mm -hmm. it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. um, because everything revolves around the distillery I'm lucky enough to have lived in four or five distilleries uh, <laughs> in my time. Uh, my kids grew up in a distillery, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's an absolutely fantastic place for kids to, to grow up and play. You know, you've got, okay, in the modern world where health and safety is everything, you know, <laughs> do you want them going and playing amongst the empty casks? Probably not, but <laughs> my, my son could recognise a, a barrel, a hogshead or a butt <laughs> from about 50 metres away when he was two, <laughs> you know, just, just by looking at them. So you do get that. It's a, it's a different atmosphere um, because of the fact so many people live here and it becomes your life. You're, you raise your kids here. Yeah. It's a fantastic playground, as I say. And uh, that's yeah. probably why both my children have ended up in the whiskey industry as well. They're, they're <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. probably. Yeah. And, and for as company-wise, you, you do have uh, the people who rent the house. They, they all do have jobs. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. They all pay yes, rent. That's it. And they, they pay the rent and they can't actually avoid paying rent because we can take it out of the pay packet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't come to that because no, it's, no. Yeah, it's, a, it's a family. It's, a, it is, it's yeah. one, one it community. Is. So, yeah. Yeah. It is. And the, so the downside many people is, are, are like, like uh, generations here? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the former master distiller, mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Campbell, who I think he was almost finished his apprenticeship when he left. He worked here for about 54 years. <laughs> uh, his son works here uh, as a warehouse operator, you know, so oh, their okay. their husbands and wives are Cooper. His father mm -hmm. drives the forklift. His mother is actually the reception, or the mm -hmm. office manager, I should say, downstairs here. Uh, okay. You know, so our, our company secretary is married to the, one of the head warehouse men. You know, so <laughs> so it's, it's a, it's it a is, small town. It is a very, very small town. It was a bit town. confusing when we drove in. We were like, okay, this is the distillery. So, wait, wait, there's, there's a school girl going to school and their house is here. Wait, we, we, we've already left the distillery. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, to, my, to my mind, it's a fantastic atmosphere. Yeah, it's it, fantastic. It just makes it more homely, more, mm. you know. Yeah, people, we, we people also run passionate. a family business and, and family business, are, I, I like it. It's yeah. just yeah. it's just yeah. the way of life. Um, it is. I mean, if, if my family had followed the same rules as we kind of do here at Tomatin, I may actually have owned Highland Park since that was one of my <laughs> forefathers that founded it. Eusen, also, yeah. Eunson, Magnus Eunson, yeah. <laughs> but sadly, he didn't leave it to me in his will, so, um, uh, so I, had, I had to move elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, so the the next one is the the 12 now. The 12 year old, yeah. 12 year old is really our core expression, for want of a better mm -hmm. word. Um, it's the the key one for us, it's our bread and butter, it's, it's the biggest seller. Legacy's catching up, but 12 is still the biggest seller. It's the most complicated recipe of all the whiskies that we do, Ooh, okay. by a long way. Mm. Um, but it needs to be. It's it's not one that, that I've been involved in the creation of. We've had it for a long while now. So I, I view myself more as the custodian. Uh, I look after it. Mm -hmm. I try and enhance it in certain areas where I can improve on what's there, but it's mostly about consistency. So the one thing that the 12 year old always tries to do is achieve a lovely sort of harmonious balance. You know, when you notice it, no single feet you should dominate. When you taste it, again, no single feet you should dominate. Mm -hmm. It should be uh, an interesting journey, for want of a better word, again, to, to get to all the, the subtle characters mm -hmm. um, that are in there, both in the nose and in the flavour. So you could argue round about a third of this will be matured in ex-bourbon casks. Now that can be first fill, full maturation, second fill, full maturation, and some finishing. Same goes mm -hmm. with about a third will be sherry casks. So that will be first fill Oloroso, second fill Oloroso, and some Oloroso finishes. We also then have some dechar recharge casks, uh, and we have some refills um, that are probably third or fourth fill, all going into this um, in different percentages. Um, and even then, 
ex-bourbons are relatively standard in the, the whiskey that will come out the other end after mm -hmm. 12 years. Sherry casks, it's a much, much more difficult sort of mm -hmm. character to guarantee what will come out. I mean, a lot of the whiskey industry in Scotland now are using seasoned casks, mm -hmm. you know, rather than using ex Oloroso, uh, sorry, ex Bodega casks. Bodega casks, you have no idea how old they are. They could be 10 year old, they could be 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And the influence that they will have on our spirit is variable. Mm -hmm. So we, we get some ex Bodega casks, because we still like to use them, but we also use sherry casks which are actually new oak, which are then seasoned for us over in Hareth, mm -hmm. um, so that we have a much better knowledge of what impact they will have on our whiskies. So it makes the, the nosing and sampling of each tanker that goes off for bottling slightly easier. Yeah, the, the sherry casks are also being refilled at the bodega, so yeah, that's that it. is, yep. it's, it's probably a big difference between a re, 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 refill than whiskey, cask than a yeah. seasoned one. Yeah. It is, yeah. And that, that's why we, we, we still like to use both, because the Expedica casks are more traditional, but the seasoned ones mm. make it easier for us to know what we can expect in the final product coming out of the cask after the maturation. Yeah. You know, but by using both, it leaves a bit of flexibility in there and a bit of unknowns, because sometimes you will go and nose a cask in the warehouse and go, wow. You know, that, that's not what I expected. That is unbelievably good. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas when you know with the season cast what you're going to get, the chances of that pleasant surprise might be slightly less. So by, by doing both, it gives us the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's really what we're trying to do. Okay. Slange? Slange again, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. So hopefully you'll see what mm. I mean about the balance in there. You mm. know, you get the sweetness, you get the fruitiness. You also get the, the sort of rich dried fruit, like fruit cake mm. coming through from the sherry. Um, hints of maybe even nuttiness coming through from the sherry. You know, so that there's quite mm. a wide spectrum of flavours and aromas in there. But they all appear at different times. And if you added a splash of water, you would find them different again. Mm. There's great complexity in there, which is The first thing is, what, 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 what I find was a kind of a, a softness, creaminess to it. Yep. yep. Then it, it's a nice sweetness that is, uh, yeah, it's going in, into a, a, a diff, uh, many directions, I would say. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I the, like the it. follow on flavor, I'm getting more of the spiciness coming through now. Yeah. It wasn't there initially. The follow up is, or uh, the, the aftertaste yeah. is more of that intensity. Yeah. 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 So to me, this, this is a whiskey that uh, appeals to a wide range of people. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very, arguably, dangerously easy to drink, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it's one that it doesn't have a huge amount of, of sherry, it doesn't have a huge amount of peatiness, it doesn't have a huge amount mm -hmm. of anything. It's all quite harmonious, as I say, which mm -hmm. to me is, is what it really should be. It's, it, when I first came here, the 12-year-old always struck me as being well-balanced, and, and that's what I'm trying to continue with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, a, a great everyday dram as well. That, yeah. that what I would say, uh, is just... It's a, a little bit of a relaxed, uh, soft, uh, everyday kind of dram. The other one was a bit more additive and yeah, it had great oak in it as yeah. well. This yeah. this one is, it had the oaky side is there, but it's not uh, yeah. not too big. The, mm. the, the legacy is like a, a rebellious teenager. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. quite, quite exciting, quite vibrant. Mm -hmm. The 12 year old is that bit more mature. It's calmed down. It's just mm -hmm. nice, pleasant easy drinking whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I had a bit uh, around, a look around even what I, what wasn't active production. And we've seen that you still have some old wash bags that mm -hmm. you don't use anymore because yeah, yeah they were not that in great shape. <laughs> and you still had another mash tun over there. And yep. you still had tons of place for stills. You have two stills, you're not running. So uh, you have tons of place in your warehouse. So you could easily expand is that. Yeah. And with, with demand of whiskey going up that way, are you, are you planning to expand? Or? We, we, we are looking to increase. Next year, we'll increase by around about 250,000 litres oh, okay. uh, of alcohol production. <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that's a reasonable increase. Mm -hmm. So we'll be up to about 1.85 million next year. Year after that, we'll probably look to get up nearer the 2 million again. Mm -hmm. um, 
and again for the for the next five years anyway, we think mm-hmm. we will increase production. It's one of the things that you know the, we can't just decide right if we ran twenty four seven forty eight weeks of the year. Um, we could probably do about four and a half, five million litres of alcohol here. So it's a big site. Oh, okay. You know? But without to, new wash bags, without with any increase in and wash 168 bags, uh, hours of maturation, uh, fermentation. Um, yeah, we should be able to. Oh, okay. That's four and a half million if we keep everything exactly as it is in production. Okay. Um, but we may have to look at having some short of fermentations as well. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all things we would look at if we decided to go down that route. Um, so we, we've got quite a gap from where we're at to where we could be. Mm-hmm. Um, so that the amount of investment in new kit, mm-hmm. new equipment, there's none. Um, well, you don't need to if you, if no. you still have room for 4.5 4, uh, million we, litres. We, we, have, uh-uh. we have, what, 14 warehouses on site, 195,000 cask spaces roughly. Mm-hmm. We've got 167,000 in there at the moment. So if we went up to the 4 million even mark again, mm-hmm. that would require a bit more warehousing. Ah, okay, so warehousing. So warehouse, warehousing, we could, we could put more in, we've got space. But within the next five to ten years, we would definitely start to run out of space. Mm. We have some of the casks on site we don't own. We rented out space over the years to other mm-hmm. whiskey companies. So we need to get them to remove their casks to give us more space to put ours into. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that wouldn't be a, a switch that we could flick overnight. Um, it would cost um, us a lot in production terms as well. But you can gradually increase we are and, looking and to working ramp into up it. Again. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're okay. looking to ramp up again. But and it's... It's an interesting, interesting time to be involved in Tomatin because mm-hmm. we've gone from being a, a whiskey basically produced to go into other people's blends, if you go back to the 70s mm-hmm. and 80s, even into the 90s, in fact, whereas now we are very much about the, the brand itself, Tomatin, as a single malt, mm-hmm. um, and what we can do with that going forward. We have our own blends as well that we need to cater for, so we still mm-hmm. do reciprocal deals with other companies to get their malts and grains and things in. Um, but yeah, we, we can definitely ramp up production here relatively easily. If we then decided that four and a half, five million isn't enough, and we're talking a few years down the oh, line. That, that would be... I think I might be retired by then, but <laughs> again, we do have a second mash tin. Uh, it would need a lot of what We would need to put the sign yeah, yeah. back in it for a start, because <laughs> it's opened up to let tourists and visitors see in it. Um, the second mill, we probably wouldn't need. We could get away with one. We do have a second mill on site. It was taken mm-hmm. out just last year. Um, and we're hopefully going to get it trimmed up to go on display. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, it would get a lot of money on the second-hand market because uh, these mills are really in demand. Oh, they are, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a Porteous mill, yeah. um, dating back to around about the 1930s, I believe. What we want to do is not sell it. We want to open it up so that people coming here can see inside it. Um, try and get the screen and everything back as well so that folk can see inside the screen to see how it operates, weighing mm. machine, all of that we still have. Oh, so if we can rebuild nice. that but opened up so that folk can see it. We already have the mash tun, a full louter tun, mm. um, the old one. I think it was the first full louter in Scotland um, mm. to be used. It's in place still, but the side was taken out of it again to let people see inside it. Um, we have a condenser that's opened up. You know, it's, it's trying to be more educational in the tours that we provide. Yeah, here. I've seen that that yeah. uh, you have some displays that are really not uh, yeah with the regular types. So yeah, yeah but that, that's that's part of the mm-hmm. part of the fun we can have with having a distillery that used to be so big we had two of everything. <laughs> um, we can now use one of everything for a display and actually use one of everything in the production process. Mm. So it's just something that, that bit different, you know, that because we were so big back in the day yeah. that uh, we no longer need to be. We're no longer selling lots of new spirit to other whiskey companies. And that mm. was a decision taken to put us in charge of our own destiny, so to speak. Yeah, so. Okay, so... The next one is now a bit of a, a darker spirit. It is indeed. It's slightly older, mm-hmm. but much different colour, much darker. Mm-hmm. Um, a sort of russety brown colour, perhaps, would be a good description for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it is our 14-year-old. The 14-year-old is a reasonably simple recipe, again. Um, and this was one that, once more, I, I was heavily involved in mm. after I came here. So the, the 14-year-old's probably been on the go now for about eight years, somewhere in that region anyway. It 
is one that we wanted to help complement the, the fruity sweet flavours, the house style, mm -hmm. with something just that bit richer, deeper and more vibrant. And what we decided to use was actually ex Tony casks, Tony port Tony casks. Port cask. yeah. So that we import them directly from uh, Portugal. Um, the original ones we got back when we first started this whole experiment were about 30, 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd been used quite a few times. And with the tawny pour, it's not as, as sweet as a red pour, a ruby pour. Um, you get much more of nutty characters coming through in it. You'll find that in the whiskey, hopefully, but what you'll also find in there is lots of sort of mixed fruit type characteristics. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the combination of, we use refill casks for most to go into the, the port casks for a finishing period of around about two years. Mm -hmm. can sometimes be up two and a half and can sometimes be down just under the two years. But on average, it'll be between two and two and a half years, the, the finish in the port cask. If we matured fully in it, the port cask would overwhelm a lot of our subtle house style type characteristics. So by using the finish, um, we can help complement that flavour with a, a completely different set of characters coming in. Again, not aimed to overwhelm, but just to, to mix and merge in mm -hmm. there. I like it. It has a bit of a nuttiness to it. Yeah, and, and definitely. For me, I'm not quite sure if it's just association of smell that it has that is that nuttiness that usually comes for me with chocolate. Mm -hmm. So is there a chocolatey type in there? Mm, maybe. Maybe I, I, I just I, just put it in there because of the, the almonds yeah. that always come with the chocolate. Yep. I, I, I definitely find chocolate in this. It's you do? The key, okay, maybe key it's not that. I'll find in there, yeah. <laughs> and it's normally a dark chocolate that I will find on the nose. Mm -hmm. But when you taste it, sometimes I'll find it more of a milk chocolate. You know, yeah, it almost evolves that wee bit. It's hard to tell because uh, you could say it's a dark chocolate, but with all the sweetness, you, you tend to want to say, yeah, probably a milk chocolate. Yeah, or even a white chocolate. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, kind of. it's, it's a very complex whiskey again, um, which yeah. is, it's, it's one of the things that we would expect with a tomatoness to have that complexity there. Mm -hmm. um, our new mix spirit is relatively complex, you know, mm -hmm. so that will follow through into the final product. But, mm -hmm. but no, this one, it's also at 46% alcohol by volume, this one, you know, so it's oh, got a slight more, more alcohol in it, non-chill filtered, uh, etc. as mm -hmm. you would expect of that strength. Um, and natural colour coming entirely from the, the port casks. Obviously, there's a hint of colour there from the refill cask initially, but the vast majority of this deeper colour comes from the use of the tawny port casks. Um, but to me, it's, it's another example of the, the whiskey industry is inclined to suffer from a bit of stigma mm -hmm. on the use of finishing. You know, oh, it gets okay. bad press sometimes for being, it's, it's trying to improve really poor quality whiskies. Mm -hmm. It's not. To me, that is another tool in our toolbox to allow us to create whiskies that are that bit different. You know, mm -hmm. that you could mature fully in port casks, yeah, but as I say, it would probably be overwhelming. Uh, yeah. It would be too intense. Yeah. You know, so if, if you, I don't know why, why that should be bad press. If you improve a whiskey, why is that a bad press? Yeah. <laughs> if you improve that, a whiskey, that's, that's a good thing. That's my view on it. <laughs> Slanger. Mm-hmm. White chocolate we spoke about earlier, I'm finding that in there, a sweetness, but it's also definitely this mixed sort of fruits and berries almost mm. in there. You know, that it's it's a different different mm. range of characters altogether from the 12. It's definitely a different kind of fruitiness that we had in the other one. Yeah. I have a bit of that, yeah, house character, distillery character yeah. going on, but it's uh, more of a nuance. The, the cask is quite strong in here and yeah. it's more of a... Um, Grapey for, for me, this is it is grapey as in wine grapey, yes. but also a bit of like fresh grapes as well. Mm -hmm. mm. And yeah. yeah, dried fruit character, chocolatey character, mm, nuttiness more on the nose than in, in the taste, but still pretty nice. It is, yeah. I mean, this, this is quite a popular whiskey, it's it's verging on being too popular. Um, mm -hmm. that. There are limited amounts of port pipes that we can access of the quality that we want to use. Um, so it's a case of, you know, the 14 year old, we have to be careful on how much of it we actually sell worldwide, which is a mm. great problem to have, don't get me wrong, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. <laughs> you know, but it, it could probably sell more 
in more countries if we were to export it everywhere. Um, but there are finite amounts of stock we have. We're building that slowly. Mm. Um, and it, it, this one, is, it's one of the core yeah. range. It'll be there for forever. Mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if you increase your production now, then yeah, 14 years in time, then we have the whiskey. That's a bit of the thing with the whiskey industry. You have a bit of a, a long lead time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the, you know, the legacy is, mm -hmm. is the youngest of the expressions we have here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the virgin oak casks in there will be around about five years old, approximately. Mm -hmm. If you leave it much longer than that, it becomes too astringent. It will be a, a, a strong whiskey then. This yeah. is a, a nice everyday dram. Yeah. I would say the 14 year old is a bit is a bit beyond that. It's it's one that we would say it goes into the you can have it more often, but it's more of a one that you want to savor. Yeah. That I would, you I would want agree to with that. Really yeah. focus and maybe not read a book while doing it or watching TV while doing it. You may more focus on the whiskey because it's yeah. just yeah it's that good. It mm -hmm. is. But one of, one of the challenges we have is we use bourbon cask in the legacy. Mm -hmm. Well, if we sell too much legacy, there's not enough bourbon casks left mm -hmm. to go into the 12 year old. If we sell too much whiskey at either legacy or 12 year old, we don't have enough stocks left to go into the 14, into the 18, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, you know, so managing it's, it's a, a difficult warehouse. stock profile to manage. Uh -huh. For Man all whiskey uh -huh. distillers. And managing a warehouse and having so many different expressions. It's probably really a, a, a big job. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I have no hair left. It's, it's all been pulled out over the years. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Mm. But in the end, it's um, better to have a big warehouse with, with a lot of stock in it than to have an empty warehouse. So, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So I've seen you ha have still got quite some capacity left. We do. So, uh, is it is it possible that we you stock more? Or? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think we will. I mean, as I said earlier, we're, we're going to increase production um, each year in a in a, a, mm -hmm. a gentle step by step basis. Um, that means we will need more warehouse in capacity because mm -hmm. um, we're obviously planning to sell more twelve year olds, you know, in ten years time than mm -hmm. we currently sell. So we need more space to hold that to mature. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it is something that, it's, it's one of the projects I'm looking at at the moment, is how to make best use of the warehousing we have, mm -hmm. which warehouses are in need of repair, because the last one built was in 1975. Some of them are much older than that. Mm -hmm. So we may need to look at building new warehouses, okay. or renovating the ones we've got. Um, so all of that is part of the, the sort of complicated calculations we've got to make going mm -hmm. forward. So we're, we're looking at really a five to 10 year plan. Um, that's part of my job at the moment is looking at that and trying to put budgets in place for the next five years to help us develop that. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, there's so many unknowns. We, we don't know how many people will continue to drink whiskey. If India comes <sighs> online, that could be a massive number of people <laughs> drinking Scotch whisky, you know, and there's not enough Scotch whiskey in Scotland, you know, yeah, to cover that. So there's so many uncertainties there that we can only try and build up stocks as best we can with yeah. a, a semi-clear crystal ball with an idea of what we want to do going forward. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the, easy. the biggest whisky in the world is, uh, is an Indian whisky. Yeah. Yes, and I think these people will also yeah, the whole situation, economic situation will lift in the end oh, yeah. and yeah. they will become richer and they will want, will become uh, more, yeah, looking for more expensive, and more, Absolutely. more Absolutely. quality. So yeah. I, I guess that from my point of view, probably will go up with the demand of whiskey. We're just seeing, just seeing the demand increase over the last two decades for single malt whiskey was just really, really good. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it can always have a dip like in the, the 80s can. with the blend, but yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm not quite sure. I, I would say probably not. Yeah, I, And if I, to have a great stock is better than to have well, not have a great yeah, stock. Definitely, because ultimately, <laughs> even if it's sitting in the cask and warehouse, it's becoming more valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. So that your, your, your stock value, your company value is only ever going to increase, even if mm -hmm. it's sitting there. You know, cash flow is obviously going to be a problem from a business point of view if you don't yeah, sell sure. enough. But but um, it's it's good to have that stock set in there for the future, 
that we can hopefully increase sales in a controlled manner. Mm -hmm. you know, it's How influential is your, your mother company for that? Um, to be fair to them, they're not really. I mean, obviously, there are the majority shareholders are both located in Japan. We, we were the first distillery in Scotland to be wholly Japanese owned. Mm -hmm. um, they don't tell us how to make the whiskey. They don't tell us how to sell the whiskey. You know, they're, they're pretty good at leaving us at arm's length. You can look at it two ways. Either they think we're doing a great job and they leave us to get on with it, which mm -hmm. I hope is the case, or they've just given up all hope of trying to get us a new country. <laughs> so hopefully the former rather than the latter. But no, they, they are they are good that they leave us um, to our own devices to a great extent to, to make and sell and promote the whiskey how we see fit. Okay. And, uh, and I think they're quite happy when they look at the bottom line each year as to, as to how we're doing. Okay. And so, if, which if is that, obviously, it's important to them. Yeah, is, the if that is, is, is running great, then, then I think they will have no problem with that. I but so. they That's do it. have experience, so, so they, they come over, try their products as well? Um, occasionally. I mean, the, <laughs> the, one, of the, one of the shareholders, the, the smaller shareholder, Kokobu, mm -hmm. are actually our importers and distributing company in Japan. Ah, okay. So we get lots more of them coming here than we do actually of our majority shareholder, Takara Shuso. Mm -hmm. um, although Takara do have a person based in the UK, he's now in London, he used to be based here at the distillery. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, they had an interest obviously in what we were doing, but as I say in fairness, they never tried to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. They were just monitoring So they're, they're were just going. happy to come once a year and go like, yeah, still good, go ahead. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yes, pretty much. <laughs> so, um, Kubokin is now the, the peated expression. It is, yes. Uh, what kind of Quebec do, Quebec do we have here? This one is what we call Creation 2. Mm -hmm. Quebecan, uh, again, only started to sell about seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we started using peated malt on mm -hmm. a small scale, like a couple of weeks in the year, a um, couple of hundred tons of malt type idea, way back in 2005, mm -hmm. um, and then left that to mature, mm -hmm. but didn't really have a plan as to what we're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, so round about, what would that have been, 2012, 2013, somewhere around there, 2014, we came up with this concept of Kubokin. We didn't want to just call it peated tomato. <laughs> you know, we needed something a bit different, make it almost a brand in its own right. So that's mm -hmm. where the, the Kubokin idea came from. The original Kubokin, which is still the, the signature, as is now known, mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of core expression, it's a combination of first fill sherry, first fill ex bourbon, first fill virgin, and some refill, about 15% mm -hmm. refill. It's the recipe for that. Um, but one expression isn't really that interesting to get people's imagination going. Mm -hmm. So we've done a few, we, we deconstructed that and had the, the virgin oak, the, the ex bourbon, the sherry, that's been sold in limited editions in the past. But this last couple of years, what we've decided to come up with is creations. Mm -hmm. um, so creations one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know where we'll finish. And this is actually creation two. Now this one, it's unusual because normally when you do a wood finish like our port, the, the 14 year old in Portwood. Mm -hmm. It's one type of cask you finish in to give you a characteristic. This is unusual that it uses two different types of casks. Mm -hmm. So in here we've got European virgin oak casks, but also Japanese shochu casks. Virgin married together. Um, virgin European oak casks? Yep. yep. Okay. So it gives you different characters. European oak is completely different to American oak. You know, that you, you get much more, much more of the sherry type flavours, right? Yep. It's spicier, richer notes coming from the European oak. American oak's much more vanilla, coconut, mm -hmm. you know, sweeter type flavours. And the Japanese was sho sho shochu. 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 Yeah, shochu, which is a, a Japanese drink, a spirit, not dissimilar to to um, whiskey, but made with, with rice and, mm -hmm. and such like. Um, so that marrying the two cask styles together um, was where this creation came from. So by marrying two unusual styles of casks is where the, the Kubokin creations is that bit different. Mm -hmm. You know, the peated 
new make spirit that we make. Um, if you go back to 2005, we were using malt with a PPM, the, the, the smokiness, the phenols, of around about 18 parts per million. But that ramped up over the years, so that this last few years it's been up well into the 30s, even into the 40, 40s. It's not going to nose and taste like an Ardbeg or Laphroaig. Mm -hmm. um, the smokiness, in fact, on the nose, the smokiness is, is quite subtle. Very it's, subtle, It's yeah. not intense on the, on the nose at all, the smokiness. And that, to me, is, it, it's, a, it's an intriguing thing, that it's almost a smoky whiskey for people who don't like smoky whiskeys. <laughs> you know, because you, you tell folk, yeah, this, this is a, a relatively heavily peated whiskey. Um, with a high phenol content, but you don't find it on the nose, you find it on the taste. And even then, you uh. don't get it on the taste immediately. Mm -hmm. It takes a second or two before you get that smokiness. So you get the sweetness, the fruity characters coming through there again at the outset uh, with the Kubokin. So this is something that we will be doing on an ongoing basis. Going forward, we'll be trying to marry two different styles of casks together to create the next Kubokin, along with the, the standard, the, the signature, um, which is the, the ongoing expression all the time. And we may look to develop the range further in the future, you know, who knows what, what the future is going to hold. But mm. but on the nose, it's, it's not that dissimilar to the Tomatin. You don't get that intense smokiness, really. There's a hint of it there. There There's is a hint, a hint of it in there. Yeah. And it has a nice uh, subtle sweetness to it. But uh, a bit of uh, fresh fruitiness, but it's not a it's not a, a very intense one. I would have expected more intense with the uh, yeah. fresh virgin America uh, yeah. European oak cask. Yeah, you don't have much it doesn't, virgin it doesn't, European oak cask no. going around there. Huh? There's not. No, there's yeah. not. It's it's a it's an interesting combination um, mm. to have married together. Um, I would love to say I did all the work on this, but mm. in reality I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I was involved in trying to supply the casks, source the casks, etc. for this. Um, but Scott Adamson, who mm -hmm. you met earlier, our, our Global Brands Ambassador, Scott works with me quite a lot um, on the sourcing of the casks. Mm -hmm. He also works with me quite a lot on the, the recipes. Um, and Kubokin is one that he really has taken on board. Um, and I've left him to his own devices to a great <laughs> extent to see what he wants to try and create with that because ultimately you know I'm, I'm going to retire in between five and ten years time probably mm -hmm. you know so that someone needs to be there to understand where the tomato recipes come from what we look for in the wood but also in the kubok and, and in our own blends you know so scott's learning that side of the business the sort of blender side yeah. um and he's he's got a good good nose in him a good attention to detail you know, so mm -hmm. I, I think this is a, an extremely interesting whiskey. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I was racing ahead of you there. Slunch. Slunch. I was too excited. Mmm. Mmm. So the sweetness is there. It's rest again, 46%, but it's reasonably smooth and creamy. And it's only after the initial taste that you get the smokiness starting to show through. Mmm. The initial mouth intake, I was amazed that it was pretty easy, but oh, now it grows spiciness. Yep. You you swallow it, you get this the smokiness. Mm. Yeah, I would I would call it medium smokiness now. Yeah, yeah. In in nose, I would say maximum Quite, lightly, yeah. maybe unpeated. Yeah, but in in the taste, you do feel the the smokiness coming through. So this is one of these it's these hiding smoking whiskeys. Yeah, yeah. this. It is. It's quite an intriguing whiskey. Mm. 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 I expected it to be a bit more, even a bit more harsh, a bit more stronger with the lower cutting point and mm -hmm. uh, oh, smokiness in there and virgin oak casks. But it's uh, it's great. Mm. It's still it's still balanced enough. Exactly. It's more on the stronger side it is yeah it's, it's much more but, robust mm. but it is actually quite a, an, an easy whiskey and that's still again at 46 percent you know so mm. it could probably do with a splash or two of water going into it that, that's up to the individual it's a it's a very subjective thing adding mm -hmm. water but but no it, it is an easy whiskey again to drink it's not 
heavily mm. challenging. You don't go, oh, I need something to, you know. <laughs> you, can, you can drink your dance and it's neat and it, it's, I like it's very it. appropriate. I like it. Accessible. Yeah, I've, I've just got to know a bit more the lightly peated whiskies now. Mm. I've found some lightly peated, because lightly peated whiskies are rare. Yeah. This this one is a bit of a medium peated. They're also pretty rare. You have a lot of highly peated whiskies. Yeah. There, there are tons of people want to do highly peated. Yeah. And tons of people love highly peated whiskies, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. including me. <laughs> me too. At the, at, the, at the end of an evening, not at the start. Yeah. yeah. If, if you do it at the start, then, then you it's, can't it's dominating. It does. Yeah. 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 But I love it. I love it. Mm. So, yeah. Great overview about the whiskies. There are a lot more expressions. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more expressions, even for different countries and older expressions. And there is, yeah. I mean, the, the oldest we've done so far um, mm -hmm. is a 50-year-old, oh. um, which was quite amazing. We have the, the Where is Six collection here. This one, sadly, is mm -hmm. empty, 1971. But mm -hmm. we have that. Um, the, the final one to be released, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is yet. Uh, it will be released in the not-too-distant future. Um, it is actually my favourite cask ever. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> sitting up in number six warehouse here. Oh yeah, there are the there's yeah. the that heavy stuff in there. Yeah, there, there's, <laughs> there's some, there's some impressive. I'm, I'm fortunate <laughs> that with the job I've had for the last three decades plus, I get to taste a lot of whiskies from different companies, different people. You know, it's one mm -hmm. of the it's the whiskey industry in general is very closely connected. You know, we all in know Scotland, one another. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that uh, we get to, to try and share our whiskies and such like. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that those casks are the best I've ever tried anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, of all the distilleries I've worked in and all the, the samples that I've had over the years, mm -hmm. there's just something about them. It's so complex. Um, so rich and so deep, but at the same time so accessible, so easy to drink. So it's one one to look out for in the future for sure. Um, yeah, I'm, but yeah, it's, I'm it's excited. A wide range of whiskeys. But it's always uh, how much how much will it cost? And that would be because the the old cars are really rare. But they are, yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for you know showing us the no the core range of Tomatin, and yeah, thank you very much for having us at the distillery. No it problem. was a, a great time. And Good. Yeah. Thank you very much for watching this video and if you found this video interesting then please feel free to share it with your friends who might also be interested in whiskey videos. Yeah, and yeah, see you next time.